Would you stand and let's welcome the presence of the Holy Spirit in this place? Let me just brag on Saturday night. Remember, I usually am hard on Saturday night. Last night, the Holy Spirit showed up in this place. Oh, yeah. And I'm telling you what, it was rich. It oh, yeah. was so thick in here. So, Holy Spirit, we welcome you at 815. We want that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead that was here last night to be here in our midst. So help us set aside all of our distractions. Help us set aside all of our cares and our worries. Holy Spirit, and come in to worship the one you've come to glorify and magnify and to exalt, and that's Jesus. So Holy Spirit, you're welcome. You're welcome in our worship, in the word, in our giving, in our fellowship, in everything we do and say. So come, Holy Spirit. Come. In Jesus' name, everyone says, Amen. 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 Let's worship.
Israel Trip Info Meeting, June 9th from 10 to 10.30 a.m. Find out more about our 2020 trip to Israel. Travel dates, prices, and deadlines are some of the topics that will be discussed. No fees are due at this time. This is simply a meeting for those who have a desire to go. So please join us. Seniors Breakfast, June 13th, 8 a.m. Breakfast takes place at the Pelican Diner, located at the Sebastian Municipal Golf Course. Breakfast is Dutch. Sign up in the foyer. Help us set up for Splash Camp, Friday, June 14th from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. and Sunday, June 16th from 12.30 to 2.30 p.m. Sign up in the foyer. Movie night, Sunday, June 23rd, 6 p.m. We'll be watching Unbroken, Path to Redemption. Stay for ice cream for a donation to Youth Retreat. Riverside Church will be at Sebastian's Freedom Festival once again this year. If you would like to walk in the parade and help us give out candy, beads, and invite cards, meet us at the Sebastian Community Center at 8 a.m. on Thursday, July 4th. Look for the Riverside Church bus. Can't walk in the parade? No problem. After the parade, we will be at Riverview Park. Join us as we hand out free water, pray for folks, and share the gospel in the Godmobile. This is not an all-day commitment. There will be seats at the prayer booth and in the Godmobile, so if you can't stand for long periods, that's okay. There are brief time slots throughout the day, and you won't be working alone. Sign-up sheets are in the foyer. So choose an area of ministry and a time that works for you and join us. We can't do it alone. For more information on these events and more, pick up a bulletin in the foyer. Thanks for coming. We're glad you're here. Yes, we are glad that you're here. Don't you think Donovan does a great job of always going over? I think you found your next calling. Radio. <laughs> Hallelujah. He also does a lot of voices too, but we won't go there anymore. So. No, he does. He's good. Hey, if you haven't picked up your new devotional, they're out in the lobby. We'd love for you to take one. You can take one to a friend. We have plenty. We'd love to give these out. This is our gift to you uh, each and every quarter. This is the June, July, August. And so if you'd like to put it on your smartphone and you want to uh, do that, there's uh, instructions on there, a little code on the back for you to do that. We'd love for you to participate. And read the Word of God. We're trying to get the Word of God into your hearts so that it can change you. Because faith comes by hearing. And hearing by word the Word of God. And so, always get the time in the world. No, no, no. Well, listen, you ain't doing anything else right now. So why don't you just do that and start? Come on, somebody. <laughs> See, just, you know, give it. Just, let's go ahead and say it like it is right now. So, lots of great things coming up. We do need your help for Splash Camp. The uh, best week of the summer. The busiest week of the summer. Uh, the tiredest week of the summer, that's what I call it, and so uh, if you can help us out to see uh, one of the team, and we'll be glad to give you details about that, all those things are coming up uh, next week, amen? amen? Who's a happy hilarious giver today? Amen. We had three people give their life to Christ on Monday at the nursing home outreach, and then on uh, Wednesday they had one give their life to Christ at Manna. Come on somebody, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise for souls being saved. So today, Lord, as we sow the gifts that you've given to us, Lord, we don't have to give, we get to give, because we're just following what you've done, you first gave to us, so that we can have life, and life more abundantly. We give so that others can come to experience the same life-giving power of the Lord Jesus Christ that we've experienced through our tithes, our offerings, our faith commitments to missions, our vision 2020 money, whatever it is that you've laid upon our heart. Would you multiply and would you meet every need as we give? Lord, we think about all the precious missionaries around the world that today are being supported. I especially think of Tom and Phyllis Benicus. They're in Brussels, Belgium at the Theological University touching the hearts of young uh, nationals who are coming to get their training so they can go back to the various countries in Europe and Asia to know more about Jesus so that they can go back and be church planners. And, and Father God, we're just so grateful.
for their work there. We're so grateful that every day, Lord, when they wait, because we're one of their supporting churches, they pray for us. So, Father, today as we give, we think about all those things. Would you bless it now? In Jesus' name, and everyone says, Amen. Amen. And amen. Let's give. Come 
says, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High. Don't, don't miss, when, when you read the scriptures, some of you read so fast, you miss words. He wants us to dwell in the secret place. Some of you right now, you're in a rush, you're in a hurry, you're trying to get through, you're trying to put the, the check mark on the box and say, oh, I went to church, I'm good. Listen, take just a and let his presence change you. Let his presence change you. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you. Let him reveal the heart of Jesus, which reveals the heart of the Father. Now the enemy right now is trying to condemn some of you, trying to you're in this, this you're, you're doing an inventory. Well, I'm not good enough. Well, I'm not righteous enough. Listen, it has nothing to do with your righteousness. You'll learn that again today. It has to do with Christ's righteousness. Oh, that's so much better. Close yourself off for just a moment. Don't worry about the person in front, the side, behind you. Don't worry about what's waiting for you at home. Don't worry about the doctor's diagnosis. Don't worry about what's in or lack that's in the checkbook. Right now, let's dwell in the secret place. Let's come into his presence. When Moses went into his presence, the children of Israel didn't even want to go. They, they said, you go on up there. When he went in and came back down, his face shined with the Shekinah glory so much the people couldn't even look on his face because he'd been changed. When Saul, who later changed his name to Paul, was confronted with a vision of Jesus on the road to Damascus, he was literally stricken blind because literally he was spiritually blind already. In other words, he was changed because of being in his presence. Slip your hands up and just begin to worship the King of Kings. You don't need Moses to lead you in that. He's already led you to the throne. Now it's time for you to enter in. You enter in by grace, through faith, just like you do with salvation. Those of you that are filled with the Spirit, you pray in the Spirit. You say, I can't do that. Yes, you can. If you're filled with the Spirit, pray in the Spirit. The Scripture tells us, Paul told us, pray in the Spirit. Pray with the understanding and pray in the Spirit. Let's just allow the Spirit of God. Let's not be in such a rush today.
they that wait on the Lord shall do what? Shall renew their strength. Some of you need your strength renewed. The enemy's been bad. That's what church is all about. That's why we come in. We, we, we're just like Solomon. I want to come in. I want to learn how my father came in and went out. We're coming into his house to worship collectively with the body. We're waiting on him. Don't miss the moment. Let the spirit of the living God do his work. You're so gracious. You're touching some folks right now. Others are wondering what the world's going on. And in all, you're right there in the midst, bringing your presence, allowing Jesus to be glorified, revealing the Father's heart to those who need to touch the Master's hand today. So we give you full permission. We give you full permission. There's some who need a miracle today, Lord. They need you to do a tangible miracle in their body. They need a healing. They need a touch. And so in the faith that we have in Isaiah 53 and in 2 Peter where it says that by your stripes we're healed. We just pray for them right now that even in your presence healing would flow. There's some who just need a touch spiritually. They just need to be energized with your spirit. May they learn how to dwell in the secret place. Not just when we're together, but all the time. So that they can renew their strength and they can find that touch. There's those that have their mind is so caught up with so many things. The enemy is just bombarding them with all kinds of Stuff, fear, doubt, unbelief. So we just come against the enemy right now. We pray that their mind would be put at peace. The peace that passes all understanding, that guards their heart and keeps their mind fixed on you. I, I pray today, Lord, that they literally shift their mind to think the thoughts that God wants us to think, what Paul told us in Philippians. Shifting our mind to think what Jesus wants us to think. Having the mind of Christ. 
so that they can be at peace. They can be at peace. So Holy Spirit, throughout this service, would you just continue to do your work? Would you continue to just touch? Would you continue to just minister? We pray that for every church that meets in your name in this community today. Because we don't minister alone. We're not the only part of the body of Christ here in Sebastian. We don't care what the label across the door is. We don't care how they worship. We don't care where they worship. We pray, Lord, that you would just meet them right where they are with your presence. Letting the Holy Spirit reveal the heart of Jesus. Magnifying the word, the Bible. So that change and transformation can come. Do it today, Lord. Do it today. We pray for our nation. Our leaders need to be born again. Some need to have wisdom so that they can govern according to your will and not their own. So we can live in peace, no matter what party, no matter what side of the aisle they sit. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May your people on this Pentecost weekend, Lord God, as they celebrate. It's a celebration of the harvest. I pray, Lord, that they realize that you are Lord of the harvest. And they'd see Jesus, the Prince of Peace. So true peace comes. So, Lord, open our ears today to hear your word. Open our hearts to receive your word. And, Holy Spirit, may we be changed in your presence. Because in your presence is fullness of joy. Because we see the heart of the Father. We see the glory of the Son, Jesus. Because that's your job. So we give you praise today. In Jesus' name. All God's people say. Amen. Amen. How about let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise today? It's hard when you're in the holy presence to come out, isn't it? Amen. Amen. Everybody okay? Amen. Oh, it's a little rough. See, we've gotten we've gotten out of the habit of being in his presence. And sometimes that's where we need to be the most. Don't be like the children of Israel that they didn't even want to go up into God's presence. They were afraid. And maybe that's part of the, maybe that's part of the, thank you, Holy Spirit. Maybe that's part of the problem. Maybe we're afraid. <laughs> maybe we're afraid of Daddy's presence. Why is that? Because we're seeing him as judge instead of father. Yeah. But let me say that again. We're seeing him as judge instead of father. Jesus always called him father. Some cases, he even called him more intimate. He called him Abba, which means what? Daddy. Daddy. And there's nothing like hearing, for those of you that have children, you understand, there's, there's nothing like hearing those words, Daddy. Daddy. Trust. Faith. Hope. Daddy. They just believe you. I mean, you know, when the world thinks you're horrible, they love you. When you know you, you, you've got a cyst on your face, they still love you. Come on, somebody. When, when you've got issues going on, they still love you. When your clothes are too tight or too skinny, they still love you. See, that's the way the Father, he just, he just wants us to do that. We just love him for who he is and what he has done for us. What has he done for us? Well, looking at that cross over there, he's given us life and life more abundantly through who? Jesus. Jesus, who died on that cross so that you could have that life. I, I'm not one of these people that does too much. I, I used to, and, and Michelle's in the back, so I've got to be careful because she'll stand up and cry, you know, false prophet. But, um, I, I, I live my life in introspection. Okay, Too much, not good enough. You know, you didn't do this. Everything didn't work the way it normally works for most people when they go into the ministry and all this. I just knew I was called when I was a child and just started. And so everything else just came later. And so for, because of that, the enemy always said, see, you're not, you're not this, you're not that. And so am I telling the truth? She's shaking her head back there. 
So just bear my soul to you, okay? So if you are constantly doing introspection, what are you going to find there? Doug, what are you going to find there if you keep looking in? You're just going to see the flesh, aren't you? Because you're, you're not looking for, see, what happened? What happened? Oh, I'm teaching today. I'm not even getting to the sermon yet. What, what happened when you got baptized? When you were water baptized, what happened to you? What happened? The old life, what? You took on a new life. Whose life did you take on? Wait a second. That devil's lying to me. Wait a second. Okay, wait, 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 wait. If you got water baptized, and if you haven't been, we'll, we'll dunk you today. We'll just take you to the river and throw you in with the alligators. Amen? <laughs> Some of you aren't, you're, you're, you're not getting it. Some of you, you're getting it. You're, you're seeing it. See, we've died to the old life. We've been raised to newness of life in who? Christ. In Christ, not in the old person. And see, we need to get rid of the old person. That, remember, remember last week? The zombie keeps trying to come what? Remember? Keeps trying to come back. Keeps trying to want to get you to think a certain way. And so we just need to say, you know what, devil, you're a liar. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus according to the word. It's not my righteousness, it's his righteousness. And I walk in that righteousness. And that helps me to live the life that Christ has called me to live. Touch your neighbor and say, that's good preaching. Amen. Touch your other neighbor and say, you need that. <laughs> okay. Matthew 16, 19 says this. We got from Jesus. He said to us, I will give you the keys of heaven's kingdom realm to forbid on earth that which is forbidden in heaven and to release on earth that which is released in heaven. This is the Passion Translation. In other words, Jesus gave us keys to be able to unlock some things. And we've taken these to be keys to breakthrough. Keys to getting breakthrough in our life so that we can see the things of God that he wants to operate in our life. The first key was surrender. And we used the widow of Zarephath who uh, had the little jar of oil and the little bag of flour. And she uh, surrendered that to the will of God. She surrendered that to take care of the prophet. And because of that, she saw her breakthrough, that God was Jehovah Jireh, her provider, and that literally every time she went back to the little pot, guess what? You're so enthusiastic about what God does. <laughs> You'd shout the victory if you saw every time you went there, and it was empty when you just cooked. And when you went back, it was full again. And when you cooked, it was empty. And when you went back, it was full again. And when you cooked, until the, fam until the famine, the, the drought was over. Surrender. The second key was obedience. We used the life of Abraham, of course. Abraham taking the child of promise. After 25 years, they waited on the promise. They took the child, and, and God one day said, uh, Abraham, and here he said, here I am. Don't you, don't you see the faith of Abraham? Don't you see? I mean, he didn't, he didn't balk. He didn't question he knew that God had a plan, God had a way. He was just obedient. That's a surrender, obedience. Put them two together. Then last week's key, consecration. Hardest key so far. Hardest key is the third key, consecration, which means set apart, which means we've literally decided that we're going to deny ourselves. Okay. This is the hardest part of the consecration key. If you constantly are using, it's all about you, me, I, well, mine, you've got a problem with consecration. Okay? You come in and you go, you know, I really don't like the music in this church. You know, I really think it's too cold. Well, I really think it's too hot. Well, I really think that pastor should shut up and preach. Well, I really think this. Or, well, you know, at my church up north... You know, the pastor never came and visited me. Oh, it got real quiet. Are we consecrated? No, because consecration leads us to what? 
to follow, deny yourself, pick up your cross, and what? Follow, follow Jesus said. What was Jesus? When Jesus came, how did he come? He didn't come. Here am I, Prince of Peace, King of Kings, Messiah, look at me right here. No, how did he come? As a what? Servant. Servant. Demonstrating that even to the twelve when he got down on his knees and he washed their feet. Right. And it depends on which gospel you read, but I think one of the people that would have been the hardest to wash would have been Judas's feet. Yeah. Because you wanted to take that towel and put it around his neck and choke him. That would have been my flesh, not Jesus. Am I helping anybody today? See, this is the problem. We, we're not consecrated. Consecration is not for the new believers because, unfortunately, they're still in that, that, that me, me, me stage. I need my blessing. I need all the goodness of God. And that's wonderful. But you know what? Sometimes we got, you know, sometimes we get blessed when we, when we learn how to serve somebody else. The very thing that we need the most, you know, our healing or whatever, we're praying for somebody else's healing. Or finances, we give to somebody else's need. Or we bless somebody else or we take care. Isn't that interesting? It's like all of a sudden all of our stuff's taken care of. Oh, get off that, Pastor Brent. All right. All right. So the second, the th fourth key, and I've got more keys, don't worry. The fourth key, every time I think I'm done, the Holy Spirit gives me at least another one. So i got three more even after this one. The next one we're going to talk about is, I'll explain it in a minute. Zachariah 4, 6 is our power. Let's go back, go back, go back. You guys can jump too far. Come on. Go. There we go. Zachariah 4, 6 <laughs> says this, not by might nor by power, but what? By my spirit. Says who? The Lord. The Lord of hosts. Okay, in this particular verse in the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, we're looking at our ability, our might, our power. It's not the same word that we'll use in a minute out of Acts. But we've got to understand that if we're going to do anything, and some of us are trying to attain and be able to, to get our, our righteousness by our own ability, we're not going to be able to do it. We're trying to attain our, you know, things in, in you know, our, our family, our situation, our circumstances. We're doing everything we possibly can. And Daddy God says, listen, you're working too hard because it's not by your ability, but it's by my spirit. And that's what Pentecost is all about. That's what it's all about. If we could just understand what he wants us to understand. I don't think it's by chance that it happened. Pentecost uh, means harvest. It means 50th. It's 50 days after Passover. And so here we are. This particular year, every year it moves a little bit because the Jewish calendar is different from our uh, calendar. The reality is they're celebrating. It's a celebration of the harvest. And so we want to look at that. So um, I want to read to you um, several scriptures and be able to give you this key. And the fourth key today is dunamis. Dunamis is a word that you'll see in Acts chapter 2, uh, a Greek word, and we'll explain that as we go along. I have two scriptures, uh, two uh, sets of scriptures, one out of Acts 1, verse 8, and then uh, the story which we want to take today, which is the day of Pentecost. Everybody okay? Because you got awful quiet. And whenever you get quiet and chew on a church, it means it's about the better you'd be at an insurrection. So I don't want you to bum rush me and tie me to the cross today. All right, here we go. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Who's speaking here? Jesus. Jesus is speaking. Hopefully, um, it's red letters in your, in your Bible. Here's what it says. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. It's not by chance that the word power is underlined here, because that's the word I want you to remember, because we'll see uh, where we get uh, dunamis from. Acts chapter 2, verse uh, 1 through 21, and really uh, your homework this uh, weekend is read Acts 1 and 2 and read it slowly and articulately so that you have the Holy Spirit help you to understand the whole story because it's way too good for me to read all of it today. But let's read the first 21 verses here. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they, talking of the apostles and those that were gathered, were all with one 
accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, and one set upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. And then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Amalekites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia and Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Hyrogyra and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, Whatever could this mean? Others mocking said they are full of new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. For these are not drunk as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what's spoken by the prophet Joel. And it came to pass in the last days that God will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants will I pour out my spirit in those days. And they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath. Blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into the blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Isn't that good news? <laughs> that whoever calls on the name of the Lord. Look at your neighbor and say, aren't you glad you're a whoever? <laughs> you're a whoever. Okay. So. Here we have the day of Pentecost. So much controversy with this topic. So much issue right here. And I believe that the reason is because the enemy wants us to stay away from the power. Because if we get filled with the power, the very scripture that Jesus spoke, the gates of hell shall not be able to prevail against his church, right? The enemy knows that. And so he keeps this all in just disarray. We have those that, that get too so involved in, in the things of the Spirit. They become so heavenly minded. They're no earthly good. And they get fleshly. And they start living lascivious. And they do dumb things. And they start calling things that aren't even holy, holy. And, and listen, I've grown up in church. I don't know anything but church. And I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly. Let me just tell you. I'm convinced that church is full of granola. Fruits, flakes, and nuts. <laughs> and if you think I'm talking to you, yes, I am. So we'll just put a little milk on you. Maybe that'll soften you up a little bit. Come on, somebody. The reality is, you go that way, or you come to this extreme where we have the group that says that everything that happened in the book of Acts ceased and we no longer need it. We no longer, it's not available to us. And so we don't need this power. You know, this week, we had to buy new vacuum cleaners for our cleaning staff. And we have the best cleaning staff on the face of the planet. I'm just going to tell you. Now, is that not a fine-looking vacuum cleaner? I mean, first off, it's clean because it's new. Vicki hasn't even been here. It's her birthday this weekend, so she's going to see her brother in North Carolina. But Ashley, her daughter-in-law, has been cleaning, and she was so thankful for the vacuums. We had literally uh, had our vacuums into repair so many times. And we actually bought a vacuum that would work on our new carpet. We did it by faith because, as you can see, we're still on the old carpet. Come on, somebody. And the new carpet has to have a new vacuum because it squares. And these vacuums will actually suck the squares up because it's so strong. Well, the new vacuum doesn't work on this carpet because 
for some reason it just doesn't suck uh, hard enough. So we had to get, uh, we found these on the internet. Now in this one, let me, let me, just, let me just demonstrate it for you here. Look at that, isn't that wonderful? Doesn't it do a good job? What, what's the matter with you? Oh, some of you, you don't even know. I used to, I could do this better than all of you. I'm a janitor by trade. Come on, somebody. I'll clean you outside the church. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Vicki says I'm the best person in the world to work for because if it don't get clean, she knows I'll just come behind her and I'll clean it. Come on, somebody. <laughs> but doesn't that work good? Look at that. Doesn't that work good? Tony, doesn't that work good? Oh. It a what? No power. No power. Oh. Isn't that interesting? This is what some of you look like right here. You're beautiful. You're changed. You're cleansed. You're righteous, but you got no power. You got no power. You got no power because you haven't plugged in to the power source. Oh, it's available to you. Did you know? Did you know that there's power running all over where you're at right now? Over your head, alongside the walls, some even under the uh, under your uh, seats. Uh, because there's conduit. There's conduit in this building. <clears throat> I've been here long enough that I was uh, kind of like the building, uh, you know, contractor, helping the contractor. I was his assistant. I was basically the guy on the job that said, you know, Bill would call and say, hey, make sure they do this. Grant, can you get this done? Little things for the CO to get accomplished. And so I've seen every phase of this building and the classroom building and even the um, uh, snack bar building be built because it's just... That's how long I've been here. So there's conduit just runs. All these new lights that we put in and every plug and even the plug that I just plugged in up there. But the, the thing to get the, the, the piece of equipment, the light, the vacuum, the sound system, whatever it is, we've got to do what? we got to plug in to the power. Whoa! Boy, that's a good sounding vacuum cleaner, isn't it? Thank you, Orlando. Give Orlando a big hand for being such a nice fan. And if you'd like to use that later, we'll let you vacuum the whole sanctuary. So. You gotta plug into the power. You see, the, the power that the disciples didn't have, Jesus told them in Acts chapter 1, and I think it's verse 4, yes it is, he said, and being assembled together, this is Right before Jesus, this is 40 days after the resurrection, 40 days after he's shown himself to many people, he showed himself to the disciples, he showed himself to all his followers, and now he's standing on the mountain, and historians and theologians and scribes and different ones say that there were probably about 500 people that were assembled there to see and hear Jesus' last words. Now, how many of you believe that the last words that Jesus speaks before he ascends into heaven are probably pretty important. Right. I, I'd say that's kind of a, a duh statement, you know. And so he says a few things here. Of course, we already read one, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But in Acts chapter 4, it says, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which, he said, these are red letters, you have heard from me. Verse 5, John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Of course, after the 40 days, 10 days would be Pentecost, and here we are. Now, it's interesting that John, his cousin, who had told the people when he was baptizing in water for the repentance of sin, he said that there was one who was coming after him whose shoes he was not worthy to tie or untie but that he would baptize you in the Holy Spirit and fire. That's what he said. And so here we have Jesus saying, you're going to be baptized in the Spirit. We've just seen the, or, or, or read about the wind, and we've just read about the tongues, the cloven tongues of fire. We've, we've seen the miraculous take place here. And, and, and I get some of you got some issues and some problems. And listen, you're just going to have to trust the Holy Spirit. You're just going to have to commune with Him and dwell with Him so that you can have some understanding. Friends, let me tell you something. I am not neither can. I'm not over here being wacky and tobacco, and I'm not over here saying it's all cease and desist. Because listen, if that's the case, if that's the 
case, then there's nothing in Scripture that you need. Let me say that again. If everything is ceased, if, and I know there's a huge contingency out there. I've read more books by people that I highly respect who think that we're literally, my, my, my people, my Pentecostal charismatic people are not going to heaven. They're convinced of it because we believe the book cover to cover, Genesis to Revelation. We believe that the Spirit of God is still alive and well and still wants to move yeah. on the earth today. Yeah. So, so I always ask my cessationist brothers, if you don't believe that the Spirit of God is still moving, then how are you saved? Right. Oh, you didn't hear me. How did you come to Christ? Because the Holy Spirit of God is the very one who has to woo you to Christ. He's the one that gives you the ability to say Jesus is Lord. That's the beginning. And see, the reality is, if this is the case, then everything that there is not necessary for us. And that's hogwash. As Robert Morris, the pastor of Gateway Church says, he says, I'll give you a, a Greek word. That's balagna. You know what baloney is? That's baloney in the Greek. He made that up. Because I looked for it. It's not in there. <laughs> See, the reality is the enemy is trying to keep us from plugging in to the power. Because if we plug into the power and the Holy Spirit begins to start transforming our life, Oh my goodness, think about the power that is dispelled in the earth and people begin to see. I mean, we know, we already talked about it earlier, when Moses went up to the mountain, the people didn't even want to go up. He said, you go up, we don't want to go up there. And when he went up in the very presence of God, the tangible presence of God, he was changed. When Paul had that encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus, he was changed. People are going to know that you've been changed and touched by the Spirit when you allow that power to work in and through you. Amen. And it has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with Him. Amen. Boy, that's good. Boy, that's good. So, here's dunamis, all right? Here's the, the meaning of dunamis. Dunamis, of course, this is the definition out of the keyword uh, Greek and Hebrew study Bible. Specially miraculous power, ability, abundance, meaning, might, miracle, power, strength. This is an interesting word, violence. I'll explain that in a minute. Wonder, to be able, force. So this is what dunamis means. Remember, in English, most of our words are very limited. This is, of course, a Greek word. I thought violence was very interesting. And I was like, okay, Lord, how's that one? He said, don't you remember? The kingdom of God suffers violence and the... Violent, take it by force. That's right. Now, what does that mean? That doesn't mean we're out killing people. <laughs> but that means we're being vigilant for the things of God. We're being forceful. We're using the strength, the power to be able to live the life that God wants to us. Do you know what we get in English for the word dunamis? We get a word that we use that if I lit a stick of it and threw it in this room, everybody in the room would run out. That's where we get the English word dynamite. Because what does that dynamite do? It does what? It's power. It's force. It's strength. It's ability. Think about all those tunnels y'all have been through up there in the mountains. How did they get there? They didn't pick at them. No, they stuck sticks of dynamite. And they loved it. Have you ever seen them old boys when they're fishing with dynamite? If you've never seen that on television, you need to watch that. Where they just, the old boys are out there and they're just like, I mean, first off, we know they, they've had a little bit of the fire juice. Come on, somebody. Because anybody that's playing with that kind of stuff, all right? And they take a stick of dynamite and they throw it in the lake. And all of a sudden, kaboom. And all the fish come right to the top. And they just go and they pick them up. That's the laziest fishing. See? There you go. Bony, you and Mason need some dynamite. And you just need to throw it in that ocean. And just let them keep mackerel come to the top. I'll give it a try. <laughs> I can just see we're all about to get arrested. All right. And you know what? Knowing him, I'm going to say, Pastor Brett said. <laughs> Dunamis. Power. Power to do what? Power to transform your life into the image of Christ. Power to change the circumstances.
places in your life from where they used to be to what he wants them to be to give you the destiny and the purpose that he's called you to. Power to be able to give to a friend who needs that prayer, that encouragement, that healing, whatever it is. See, it's not your ability, it's his ability. Amen. It's him working in and through us. So today, because you're so interested, I have ten aspects of the Holy Spirit's work that I want to share with you that Jesus himself said, because some of you missed it, when Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, I think it's verse 5, he said, or verse 4, he said, you've heard me talk about the promise of the Father. Well, it's these three chapters, John 14, 15, and 16, where Jesus talks a lot about the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, the Helper, and we'll explain those words as we go along. And so I've got ten aspects of the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. The first thing that the Holy Spirit wants to do, the Holy Spirit comforts us. In John 14, 16, it says this, And I will pray the Father, Jesus said, and he will give you, now remember, notice, everything is going to be past tense, because it hasn't happened, or, or, or post tense, because it hasn't happened yet, all right? It hasn't been experienced. See, Jesus is still walking on the earth. For us, it's already happened. It's past tense. So understand that. We just read Acts 2. I will give the Father, and he will give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. This word comforter in the Greek is two words, parakleto, which basically means another who's going to walk alongside you. Another that looks like Jesus. Another one that comes alongside. See, the Holy Spirit has touched people throughout the Old Testament and even in the beginnings of the New Testament before the day of Pentecost. But he hasn't been poured out into the hearts and lives of every person and been accessible. See, here's the thing. We look at this and we say, okay, I get it. He, he promised us a comforter. But notice, notice, see, the enemy wants to keep our focus on all the wacky tobacco stuff. And what's that comforter do? He comes that he may abide with us for what? Forever. forever. He comes to abide with us forever. That he's always going to be there. That every time you're in need, he's right there. I mean, that's why when we come in to worship, we should expect every service to sense and know the power of God and the presence of God. Because that's what the comforter wants to do. The comforter wants to come when they say you got cancer. And then he just comes. And he just covers you. You know what? She's cancer free. Did y'all know that? Yeah. child that's just causing you an issue. When you've got a financial issue, the Holy Spirit just wants to come and cover you. Go back to that scripture out of Psalms 91. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide. Shall abide where? Under the shadow of the Almighty. Listen, the Holy Spirit's been sent to shadow you and show you the Father. Come on, somebody. Yeah. Number two. Ten aspects of the Holy Spirit's work. The second thing is the Holy Spirit indwells us. John 14, 17. All right, here we go. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him. Now notice, remember, this is post tense. For he dwells with you and will be in you. Jesus telling the disciples. He says, listen, he says right now. The Spirit's going to dwell with you, but He's not just going to dwell with you. He's going to actually be inside you. He's going to be inside you. Think about that. He comes to dwell with us. He comes to partner with us. To help us to see Jesus and have a fresh revelation every single day. To get our focus off of all of our difficulties and our problems and our circumstances and our situation. So that literally that dunamis power can constantly be working in and through us every single day, no matter what we're going through. The third and the fourth principle we put together here, ten aspects of the Holy Spirit's work. Number three is the Holy Spirit teaches us. Number four is the Holy Spirit reminds us. Look here at John 14, 26. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, notice again, will, he's already been sent. Of course, this was before Acts chapter 2 will send in my name, he will teach you all things and will bring to your remembrance all things that I have said to you. Now, listen, he will teach you all things. You've got to help by doing your part. The way you help by doing your part is you need to read the word. Yeah. You need to cover yourself with the word. 
But how many of you have said before, I don't understand everything that's in this book. I don't understand. You know what? I have a hard time reading Revelation, or I have a hard time reading some of the prophets, or I have a hard time even understanding some of the things that Jesus said. Listen, that's what the Holy Spirit's job is. He's your professor. And he's free. He doesn't cost you any $50,000 college debt. Come on, somebody. He wants to teach you what? All things. And then, not only does he teach you, but he helps you to cheat on the exam. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Holy Spirit brings back to remembrance all those things that he's taught you. Who taught you? Jesus. I can only imagine the disciples who have spent three years with Jesus, and Jesus is telling them this, and they're going, shoo, because I don't know if, if you know, so-and-so wrote down fast enough, and, and I can't remember. How many of you, you've been in a situation where you've been ministering to somebody, or talking to somebody, or you're, you're sharing your faith with somebody, and you're trying to remember that scripture, and all of a sudden, it just pops right in your head? Yeah. And not only what it says, but chapter and verse, so that they can go look it up. Guess who that is working in your life? That's the Holy Spirit. That's what he's called to do. That's what he wants to do if we will just allow him. Let's give him something to work with. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Spirit of God wants to teach us. He wants to remind us. This for some of you, this is where some of you got some timers. You know, sometimes you remember it and sometimes you forget. Aren't you glad the Holy Spirit doesn't have some timers? Come on, somebody. Number five, ten aspects of the Holy Spirit work. The Holy Spirit testifies with us. John 15, 26. John 15, 26. But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. Every time the Holy Spirit comes, isn't it interesting? What does he do? He actually just turns the conversation. He turns your heart. He turns your mind. He turns your focus. Where does he turn it to? Himself? Never. He always turns it to who? Jesus. He's always revealing Jesus. Jesus reveals the heart of the Father. The Holy Spirit just reveals Jesus. He testifies of Jesus. He reminds you how good Jesus is. He tells you how good Jesus has done, what he's done to transform you and give you power and give you life and help you to understand some of the stuff that you're going through. He testifies. Listen, let me tell you something. He stands up and he gives a good shout about what Jesus has done. Some of you just need to remember, you need to go back to what we talked about in consecration. And you need to remember what Jesus has done. Bearing your cross is not picking up that cross that you think is your husband. Come on, somebody. Or picking up your cross that is your boss. Come on, somebody. It has nothing to do with it. No, bearing your cross is remembering what Christ has done for you. What has he done for you? Think, think about what he's done for you. Where were you 20 years ago? Where were you 30 years ago? Where were you 40 years ago, some of you? Where were you when you were a teenager? What were you doing? What were you doing on a Saturday night before church on Sunday years ago? See, some of you don't even want to think about it. See, that's the thing. He testifies. He says, man, you remember all that junk? Don't think about that. Think about how good Jesus is. He gets the focus right off of what the enemy tries to get us, thinking about the past and condemned. We're just, we're in shame. And all of a sudden, he just reveals the heart of the Father through Jesus the Son so that we can know the goodness of our God and what Jesus has done. He came to set us free. That's why you can dance. That's why you can shout. Some of you just need to learn how to dance. You just think you got to dance whenever, you know, whatever your favorite music is. But you need to learn to dance in the spirit. Amen? Right. Even though you can't carry a tune and you couldn't do a step. Come on, somebody. All right. Number six. Ten aspects of the Holy Spirit's work. The Holy Spirit convicts us. In John 16, 7 to 11. Look at all of this. Because there's two here, but I want to explain the second one. In verse 7 it says, nevertheless, Jesus speaking, I tell you the truth. Aren't you glad Jesus never lies to us? Come on, somebody. Did you hear me? Yeah. All right, he's telling us the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. 
For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. Now wait, hold it right there. Jesus is telling the disciples something that to them is absolutely shocking. Because he says, it is better for you that I go away. And they're thinking, you're out of your ever-loving mind. We don't ever want you to leave. You can only imagine what they're thinking when, when they're going through this. See, remember, we read the scripture like this. We know it backwards, forwards, beginning, middle, and end. But they didn't know that. They didn't know what was about to transpire. They didn't know what happened in, in the uh, day of Pentecost in the upper room. They didn't, they didn't have the understanding. They didn't have the experience yet. So for us, we're kind of, kind of jaded in that. But for them, they're thinking, it's better for you to go away. And some of you are probably thinking, well, why, why, why did he have to go away? Let's think about this, okay? So Jesus comes. And he's born of a virgin. Celebrate Christmas, right? All right. He is God in the flesh, but he's fully God, yet he's fully what? Man. man. Okay. So because he's fully man, even in his resurrected body, he can't be everywhere at the same time. So let's say that Jesus decided to stay on earth. And let's say that Riverside has exclusive rights. And let's say that Jesus is only here so nobody else can have him. And if you want him, you've got to come here to get him. <laughs> and you say, oh, you wouldn't be that way. You want to make a bet? <laughs> Y'all want Jesus to come here? Yeah. But see, Jesus knew something greater. The aspects of the Father is God's omniscient, omnipotent, all-powerful, all-knowing. He sends the Holy Spirit so the Holy Spirit cannot just dwell with us, but he can be where? in us and not just the elect and not just the ones that think they're special. Touch your neighbor and say, you're special. He comes and dwells in everyone who wants him and who allows him. Now they don't get that yet. They will. But don't think that Jesus departed. He sent the helper. He sent the comforter. He sent the parakletos to come to us. I'll send him to you and when he comes, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they do not believe in me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment because of the ruler of the age is judged. Friends, let me tell you something. He not only convicts. Now, for some people, uh, there's teaching right now that says we don't need the Holy Spirit to convict us anymore because, you know, we're saved and we're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, and there's a thread of truth there. But listen, sometimes the Holy Spirit has to remind you that your attitude stinks. And sometimes the Holy Spirit has to remind you that you're not operating in love. And here's the thing. He doesn't come condemning. He's just that still small voice that says, you know, maybe you need to change that. Maybe you need to get your focus back on Jesus. He convicts the world of their sin, yes, but he convicts us also of those things that we need to change. It's a partnership. We're working together. But you know what else he does? Boy, this is good. Oh, this is good. Look at this next one. Number seven. This is way too good. The Holy Spirit also does what? Convinces us. Convinces us of what? We just read it. He convinces us in that portion of scripture which talks about conviction, which too many people get hung up on because we think that the Holy Spirit's only job is to point out all of our faults. That's not what he's doing. He's telling us, let's, let's focus on Jesus. Let's get our eyes off of our mess and turn our eyes on Jesus. But he also convinces us of what? We read it. John 16, 10, it says that he convinces us of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Convinces us of righteousness, what? We have to constantly be reminded that it's not our righteousness because our righteousness or our ability is all filthy rags. Touch your neighbor and say, you can't do anything in your own strength to get close to Jesus. You can't. I mean, I've got a Sunday school pen that will rival everyone in the room. <laughs> I was praying they would find it at my aunt's house because we're cleaning my aunt's house out. Um, she was the family, you know, kind of 
historian. She kept everything, and, and she, I think, she, I think mom said she found granddad's, but, and his is big. I mean, you know, it looks like a general, you know. <laughs> See, some of you aren't, you know, spiritual enough to know what a Sunday school pin is, you know. You know, you knew all the books of the Bible. You came all the time. You were dressed appropriately. I mean, we're talking about religion, religion, religion. And you've heard me say it. I'll say it again. Religion does what? Nothing. Kills you. Chokes you. Right. Takes the life right out. You know there's no dunamis in religion? Because there are people that religiously gamble. And they ain't spiritual. There are people that religiously drink. And they're not spiritual. Come on, somebody. There are people that religiously go to Disney World. Come on, somebody. And they don't look like Mickey. Religion will kill you, but relationship will bring you life. So forget about your righteousness and start looking at the righteousness that God has made. The Holy Spirit reminds us of that. He convinces us of it. 2 Corinthians 5.21, you've all heard this so many times. I say it almost, almost every service. This is my favorite verse. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's why the Holy Spirit reminds you every day that you need to look in that mirror and say, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, Amen. even if it's a faith walk. Amen. Touch your neighbor and say, you need to say that. Amen. In faith. I forgot where I am. Go to the next one. Number eight, nine. Okay. Ten aspects of the Holy Spirit's work. The Holy Spirit guides us and the Holy Spirit reveals to us. John 16, 13. Jesus, of course, speaking again. However, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will tell you things to come. He will not only guide you into the truth, but he will also give you the ability to understand what's going on, understanding what's happening in our world, being prepared uh, for whatever might come your way. You know, it's amazing to me. You, you guys have heard my story, and I'll tell it again for those who haven't heard it. But Holy Spirit is constantly wanting us to be aware of things in our lives. And I remember coming home to the old house. And our other house was uh, about 1,100 square feet, had one long hallway, and in the middle, we didn't have a, a, a garage when we first moved in. Uh, we had a, a carport, so the water heater was actually in the center of the house in the closet. And so uh, I'm walking in the house one day, and, and um, late at night, I think I'd come back from Springfield from a conference, and it was Saturday night, it was late, and the kids were in bed, and Shell was asleep, and it was dark. And I remember coming in the house, and I remember hearing this when I passed the closet so plainly. Check the water heater. Now, you can say all day long that's your flesh, but I know it was the Spirit of the living God. The Spirit of the living God was telling me things to come. Because the next morning when I woke up, and I put my feet on the carpet, come on, somebody. Slosh, 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 slosh. And I'm going, did somebody let the toilet run? Is the shower on? And I'm looking and I'm trying to find it. And there's no water in the bathroom. And so the carpet's wet. And I go out into the hallway and I look at the other bathroom. And I'm still not paying attention. Holy Spirit's saying, you know, check the water heater. Open the door. And he goes, told you. <laughs> <laughs> Think about it. That night I could hook the hose to it. I could have drained it. And there wouldn't have been no water in the house. Because he tells you, say, I don't believe that, Pastor. Man. Fine, you don't believe it. That's the way he speaks to me. Amen. He speaks plainly. Amen. He speaks so plainly to us. He's tender. He's loving. He's compassionate. Listen, it caused me all kinds of work because I think I was flying out again the next day to go somewhere else, which was my life back then, not by choice, or my choice, not her choice. And uh, literally, I had to pay extra to have the guy come fix the thing on a Sunday afternoon so that I could fly out the next day and go to wherever I was going out of stupidity. Come on, somebody. So here, here's the thing. He guides you, but he also, he'll tell you things to come. And, and he'll tell you things to come that you, maybe you're concerned about. Maybe you're worried about the world or all this. He'll help you. And the last thing, number 10, and I'm done. 10 aspects of the Holy Spirit's work. The Holy Spirit helps us worship. 
John 16, 14. He will glorify me, Jesus said, talking of the Spirit, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. You know, the Holy Spirit loves us when we sing about Jesus. He just, get, I'm telling you, when we're singing about Jesus, when we get the revelation, this, this is my prayer, that, that those of you that are filled with the Spirit, those that even today will ask the Holy Spirit to fill them, that literally He will give you a fresh revelation of Jesus. Because when you understand what Jesus has done, who Jesus is, and what He has done for you, let me tell you something, it will totally revolutionize and radically change your life. You will be transformed in an instant. That's what Holy Spirit does. So, you're probably asking me, all right, I get it. I want this power. How do I get this breakthrough dunamis dynamite power? I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> because, again, remember, I, I grew up in church, and I've seen it fruits, flakes, and nuts. I've seen the extremes on all this. Do you know that I found a verse that Jesus himself said that makes it so, so easy? John, Luke eleven thirteen. 13. If you then be evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Ask him. Would you stand? Put your hands up like this. Those of you that really want to be filled, and those of you that want to be refilled, because we know that when the disciples were filled on the day of Pentecost, they came back a few chapters later, rejoicing in persecution, which is amazing. And they asked for more of God's spirit, and he gave them boldness. He said, Holy Spirit came again. What do you need? Power to be able to live in this world? Peace to be able not to have troubled mind? Holy Spirit wants to do it. Stretch your hands towards heaven. Say this after me. Those of you that want it, you just believe it in your heart. Because we're asking today. You say, Father, Father I thank you, thank you. That, Jesus that Jesus said he was going to send another comforter another to help her. And so right now, 